William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's a familiar saying which goes, uh, give a rogue enough rope and he'll hang himself. The theory holds fine except in one instance. What if the chap doling out the rope happens to be the hangman? National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A confidential investigator isn't always hired on his merits. His merits as a fact finder, I mean. Some clients choose you because they hope you're stupid. They don't want a cop. They want a stooge. You ought to be the front behind which they can keep a criminal operation going. You're the rubber stamp certifying their sincerity so they can get away with murder. Yeah, you get them like that. Cases phony from the word go. That was my first hunch on Brenda Connor, a brunette with a tendency to overact. We launched her case in Central Park in a handsome carriage, complete with horse, silk-hatted driver, and lap robe. Around the park at $3 an hour. But I wasn't paying the tab. The lady was. Why the handsome cab and the freezing weather? I didn't ask. You get used to eccentrics. The rhythmic clippity-clop. I'm able to think. So who's the demon? Demon? The demon pursuing you. You have a flippant way, Mr. Craig. To cover up my emotions. I'm the type who identifies. A sad lady like you, I can cry harder than any little white cloud around. You were about to tell me. It's my husband. Funny now how it always is. Ralph Connor, he, he was gone for five years, completely out of my life. A long wait for a streetcar. I'd almost forgotten him. And then one week ago, he came back to me. And you resent his return? I didn't say that. That's right, you didn't. But you don't look overjoyed. No. But, but it isn't what you think. I have no basic quarrel with my marriage, even despite the separation, but... Throw the punchline. Ralph, this man who is my husband come back. I'm not so sure that it is he. I let Brenda Connor continue to unburden her soul over coffee. The tab was on me this time. How much coffee could a lady drink? (sighs) My alarm's about my husband, Ralph. Yes? I I don't mean to leave the impression with you that... That uh, you're sure he's an impersonator? Yes. My reaction to him since his return, my suspicions have been intuitive more than actual. I I feel I I don't know. Her husband takes off for five years and then suddenly he's back. How did you receive him? Well, gladly enough at first. You asked him questions? Yes. His explanation of his absence seemed genuine to me, understandable. He'd been out of sorts with himself. Suddenly, 40 and restless, disoriented and neurotic, full of self-dislike, dissatisfaction with the career he'd chosen. Said career? Uh, Realty management. Connor and Saxton. Saxton is his business partner. When did the doubt begin for you? The doubt, uh, intuitive as you call it, uh, that this voyager come back maybe wasn't really your husband. The very first evening, Ralph was different. A a stranger I I didn't know. After five years, he would be. Yes, yes, I know. But what I mean is the personality I once knew, the the habits, the the little things a wife knows about her husband. I could find none of them in in this man. Little things. uh, Can you give me something specific? Yes. The, the foods Ralph liked, always liked. This man has very different tastes. And even his speech, his way of phrasing things, and his thoughts so so different, so very changed. And even something physical. What's that? Left-handed. This man is left-handed. My husband, with the husband I knew, wasn't. Quite a switch, that. How about his appearance, looks? Oh, there are some differences. Still differences that 
could only mean time, how time changes the face. Ralph was full in the cheeks. This man is gaunt, thinner. Oh, mind you, I'm not saying... Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm confused. I'm so confused. I can't even think straight, Mr. Gray. Hooray for confusion. But there was more to it than the lady was telling. There always is. I got a peek into what was omitted in the telling. The time was later that same afternoon. It was raining buckets. I had my formal tie on for a ride over to see the husband, Ralph Connor, firsthand. The great thing about a jalopy, it either starts or it doesn't. Mine wouldn't. Wet wires from the downpour, I figured. But my guess was wrong. There was a gentleman on hand to correct me on it. You only run your battery down, Craig. Get off the starter. A guy in a rain slicker slouched in the back of my car. Nice eyes and an easy grin. And a familiar swell near the left armpit. I knew what that swell was. I had one myself to match it. A gun holster. The wires aren't wet, Craig. There's another reason she won't start. What's that? This. Here. Your rotor. Rotor? You don't know about cars? I know they go or don't go. The rotor belongs under the hood on the engine where the distributor is. I removed it. Why? So your car wouldn't go. Why again? So you'd bum a ride from me. Where are you parked? Right behind you. Come on, I'll show for you. You sound like you know where I'm going. Yeah, I think so. See Ralph Connor. You want to look him over? You're well informed. I took courses in mind reading. Come on, I'll drive you. To Ralph Connor, this is? No, not right away. I've got something else to show you first. Are you stalling, Craig? No, I'm thinking. About? The penalty for armed kidnapping. Twenty years. Life if you cross state lines. That's the Lindbergh law. And the chair if you compound kidnapping with murder. So what's it to be, Craig? I'd been grabbed at gunpoint before, but this one had a new wrinkle. No violence, no dent in my skull, no impulsive ride to the country. Just a short ride over to Queens, to a roadhouse you had to shove your way into. More people and floor space, a jam at the bar and a jam on the postage stamp dance floor. People laughing it up, people living it up. Look over the dance floor, you see something? Yeah, sweat and suffocation. No, I mean faces. For instance, over there, the brunette swooning all over the he-man in the plaid shirt. You see her? I see her. You know her? Brenda Connor, my clamp. Well, that ends my mission. So long, Craig. You're on your own now. Buster, wait. Yeah, Craig? The plaid shirt with my client. He's not Ralph Connor. <laughs> Married folks don't spend time here with each other. No, he's Chris Contura. He's a tennis player. A tennis player? Love matches in the hot afternoon sun and love matches under hot blue lights with slender ladies with fat checkbooks. Is this why you brought me here? To show you a two-timing wife so you discount half to 90% of what she told you. Look, uh, as long as we're talking... I've said all I want to. Uh, so you won't knock yourself out identifying me when I'm gone. Here's my card. So long again. The card he'd left with me read, Mike Hassick private detective. The guy who'd put the polite snatch on me was a private eye. I switched my plans around. You do with new developments. I didn't try to interview Ralph Connor right off. I drove over to his residence to case the place. Pretty fancy. A townhouse all lit up like utility bills were no concern to anybody. There was a parlor floor drawing room that opened onto a stone balcony. I was enough of a gymnasium genius to make the balcony without setting up too much of a commotion. After ten minutes of eavesdropping on the rustle of thick oriental carpets, I got to listen to a live show. Brenda Connor and a guy I took to be her ever-loving mister on the other side of the glass. You've got that odd look again, Brenda. L look, Ralph? What odd look? The frail, pale princess in the grip of a nameless terror. Oh, you're being cruel deliberately. Deliberately? To unnerve me. Push me to the edge of reason. Push me... Beyond the edge? Into insanity, yes. I see. Now, suppose you try the shoe. 
I try the shoe. To see how it fits you. What's been your scheme with me? Scheme? I have no scheme. The terrified glances since my return, so nicely timed when company watches so beautifully acted. And the way you contrived to look at me other times, the unfamiliar stares, if I were not your husband, but an interloper. Not an interloper, Ralph, but an... <laughs> yes, Brenda? An imposter. I see. Uh, I am not who I am. Is that what you're saying? Oh, what about me is so changed? I'd like to know, Brenda. Everything is changed. Your manner, your talk, your, your habits, so many little things. And not like the Ralph I knew, the Ralph I remember. An imposter, that was your word. Do you then really think I am not Ralph Connor? That I am somebody else, some diabolical somebody else playing at being Ralph Connor? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> It was time to get off the balcony and make a more formal entrance into the life of Ralph Connor through the front door. I started to do same when I had a mishap. Cute word, mishap. It can mean anything. It can mean a tear in your trousers from an unexpected nail. It could mean a ton of brass landing on your head. In my case, it meant the last mentioned. A ton of brass. Ooh. It fell from a height from upstairs somewhere with... Cannonball speed. What? Who? I was too sleepy to care. I just lay down. Back to Barry Craig in just a moment. And now, back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. One thing about consciousness, it always returns sooner or later. If you're not dead, that is. I wasn't. I had proof I wasn't. I could wiggle a finger... When you're dead, you can't. Rigor mortis won't allow it. I was on a couch with a guy slapping cold compresses on my forehead. A guy with nice eyes and an easy smile and wearing a rain slicker indoors. He was the private eye, Mike Hassock. Able to get up now, Craig? I'm up. What hit me? A flower pot, solid brass. It was on the window ledge three flights up. It fell? No. Oh. It was dropped on me. That's right. By whom? Me. You're working for the Mr. Ralph Connor? That's right. An impersonator. Stand in for the real article. If you want to believe a wacky two-timing wife. I see. Who owns all the loot in the family? So don't answer it. I can guess the way it shapes. My client, Brenda Connor, does. Your client hasn't got a dime. That stuff about Ralph Connor being an impersonator is the malarkey, Craig. Maybe, but answer me this. Can a man who's been right-handed to the age of 40 suddenly turn up left-handed? But don't answer it, Hasek. Think about it while I'm busy somewhere else. You're going to heckle Connor? Maybe. Oh, uh, Hasek. What? Come here to the rear window a minute. Yes? What's outside? The yard. Yeah, it's a backyard. Not much of a drop. Only ten feet, I'd guess it to be. Ten feet? So what? So one of us has to be discouraged. You've had your whack at me. Now it's... Turn about. Craig, let me go. Put me down. Put you down? Sure. Exactly what I intend doing. <laughs> you meet some guys sometimes who have to be paid back in their own coin. I didn't set up a talk with Ralph Connor. I passed him up a second time. I had nothing to say to him yet. Instead, I looked up Saxton of Connor and Saxton Realty Management. Connor's business partner. Maybe he could shed some light. A short guy with two stomachs. 
and pink ears like he was always blushing. There was an oily look to him, like he was an accomplished phony. I still don't quite understand the purpose of your call here to me, Mr. Craig. If you've stalled long enough, Saxon... If I've stalled? Worked out answers in your head. Well, I, I have no ulterior motives in evading you. Then? Well, it's just that uh, I, I don't care to become embroiled in the man's affairs. Uh, that is, his affairs other than our joint business. Frankly, I've always found Connor strange and unpredictable. Explosive. He was gone for five years. Yes. Did you keep his end of the business up for all that time? Oh, yes, scrupulously. His share of the net profits were put into an escrow account uh, for what they amounted to. His uh, drawing account, of course, was suspended while he was gone. In the time he was away, did he write to you, keep in touch? Uh, No. Now a big question. Is he Ralph Connor? Yes, Mr. Craig. You don't seem surprised at the question. No, no, I'm not surprised anymore. I've been asked the same question before. By whom? Two persons. By Mrs. Connor and by a private detective named Mike Hasick. So Hasick wasn't so sure of his client's identity either. Uh, What's that you said? Uh, Just thinking out loud. What makes you sure this new Connor is the same old Connor? Why, everything about him. Like... Like, uh, well, I, I don't know how to answer that quite. He he looks like Ralph Connor, facially and physically. He knows about me, our business, the, the background of our business. He's demonstrated all that to you? Why, uh, yes, yes, of course. He has demonstrated an intimate knowledge of our business. It, it couldn't be faked. Uh, the man simply had to know. Connor was Connor. Only thing, Saxton didn't sell me the notion convincingly enough. I double-checked on Saxton's truthfulness by applying some heat to the office bookkeeper of Connor and Saxton. Why, Mr. Saxton told you outrageous falsehoods. Outrageous! He didn't ring true to me too much. Good I got to you, Mr. Uh, what's it again? Uh, Pippet. I'm the one to tell the truth. Oh, that's peachy dandy. But uh, get around to telling it. Well, now, uh, Ralph Connor, uh, the new one, he's a queer one. Meaning? Well, when he came back after being away all that time, he didn't know my name. He kept calling me Pippin and Poppin. Pippin and Poppin, mind you, when it's Pippin, like it's always been. Pretty staggering. And and then about the business, he didn't know about the old Cameroon account. He didn't, huh? The the, the biggest account in the Connor Saxton agency, and he didn't even seem to know he had it. Like this wasn't his business. What else? Well, uh, his easy way about money. Tipping me a dollar when he sent me out for coffee. The old Ralph Connor only tipped five cents. Is the new Ralph Connor also easy about money in other ways? Business ways, for instance. I, I, I don't know what you mean. I mean like not asking for an accounting from Saxton to cover the five years Connor was away. Well, then, there never was an accounting. And, and Mr. Connor never yet asked for one. Well, you'd know that. You're the bookkeeper. Oh, yes, yes. I'd be the one to know, all right. Is there an escrow account with Connor's share of the profits of the last five years in it? Oh, no, there's no escrow account. Well, were there any profits the last five years Connor's been away? Oh, yes, yes, good profits. Business has been very good. Uh, how good were the profits? Well, I I couldn't say without going over the books. Fifty thousand dollars, is that close to it? It it isn't far from it. Then a sharpie like Saxton would have reason to play ball with somebody not the real Connor, but an impersonator. Keep all the accumulated business profits, so long as the new Connor didn't stick his hand out or yell for the D.A. Well, I'm afraid now you're getting too deep for me. Oh, forget it. Uh, You've been a great help. You can go back to your books now, Pippin. The name is not Pippin. Oh, my mistake, Poppin. It's Pippin. It was time to form an independent impression of Ralph Connor, I figured. The townhouse sat next door to the East River. I'd just gotten to the doorbell when I found myself doing some more eavesdropping. Nothing subtle this time. Anybody for a mile around could eavesdrop along with me. A scream has carrying power. A high-pitched woman's scream. (coughs) Brenda Connor. I could identify the voice. Brenda Connor at home, either being strangled to death or blowing her top. 
Inside the house, I didn't get to see my screaming client. She was in her room behind locked doors. The husband, Ralph Connor, told me the melancholy facts. Or do I mean the melancholy fiction? Brenda is in there in her room with her doctor. Doctor who? Does that matter? It matters. I'm jotting it down in my notebook. Mrs. Connor is my client. Dr. Phipps. Uh, 275 Dartmouth Street, if you also want the address. Phipps is Brenda's own physician. I get your emphasis. When can I see Mrs. Connor? I don't know. She's under restraint. Restraints meaning? She's had a nervous breakdown. All of a sudden? No, my wife has a history of, uh, say, emotional instability. Hallucinations, compulsive behavior, a fascination for um, unsavory places and people. That's a careful reference to the roadhouse in Tennis Adonis. Mike Hassock made sure I'd see. Yes, so that you'd be aware of all the facts. Now, this emotional instability in Brenda, it's one of the reasons I left her five years ago. I've had all I could stand of hysteria. You make a glib case of it. It's the truth. What happens to Brenda Connor from here on? Hospitalization. It's not the first time Brenda has been confined before. And cured? Evidently not, as this new breakdown shows. Comes the time she's declared mentally incompetent. Uh, who gets her money? That is an impertinent question. I'll answer it. You do. You step into her estate. I'll even bet you've already got the petition before the court with Dr. Phipps' affidavit pinned to it. I don't care to dignify this nonsense any longer, Mr. Craig. So if you don't mind, good night. On the street, I had an encounter with a guy who was making a habit of it. Stop a minute, Craig. What for, Hasek? A talk. Friendly talk. With a gun in my ribs? The gun's for my own protection. You play too hard. So do you. I have to. I'm in it for the cabbage, just like you. Speak only for yourself. <laughs> You'll change your mind. A hundred grand. We split it down the middle. Who gives it to us? Connor, if you don't spoil it for him. Keep talking. Connor is a phony, an impersonator, like you said. The real Connor, he probably knocked off somewhere, the way I figure it. But none of our business. Now... This Connor grabs the wife's estate. We let him. You let him. Then the bite. He pays us off. We own him. You're sure of your facts? I checked. I sized everything up. Connor's a fake, a smart fake, and a winner. Let's win with him, okay? Why did Connor hire you in the first place, Hasek? To follow his wife around, report on who she saw, spent time with, that tennis player, you. So now tell me, are you playing it smart along with me? What do you think? I think you are. Sure you are. <laughs> what have you got against money? I played it smart, the poor man's way. I didn't go home and let Connor play out his scheme. I went back to Connor for a closer look at his scheme. You've become a frequent visitor, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Every ten minutes, sir. I realized out on the street that I'd said things in here to you that were out of line. I'm sorry. Forget it. Thanks. I can see now what a screwball Mrs. Connor is and how I went for the buck. Uh, the uh, only thing... Uh, yes, Mr. Craig. I'm a working operative. I put in time and sweat. Uh, I've had expense... Oh, I see. You've got a bill and you're wondering how you're ever going to get paid. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's no obligation of yours, I know. Oh, nonsense. I'll pay Mrs. Connor's bill. In fact, I'll uh, make out a check right here and now. How much is it, Mr. Craig? Well, uh, 100 will about cover it. $100. Very well. Uh, here you are, Mr. Craig. A $100 check for you. It means more to me than you think, Mr. Connor. Oh, you don't have to thank me. The money's due you. Huh. But I didn't mean it like that. Guess again, Connor. <laughs> I, I frankly don't understand you. I'll explain myself. You wrote out a check, and you also wrote out a confession. A confession? You're right-handed. You wrote that check out right-handed, like Ralph Connor should, since he was always right-handed. Look here, Craig. Let me finish. But you've been deliberately left-handed for Mrs. Connor's benefit since you came back to her, to confuse her about you, start her doubting your identity, see you as an imposter, but never be sure. Until she went out of her mind like she has. Oh, you, you 
can't prove a thing, Craig. All kinds of tricks like that to play on her imagination. You thin down, change your known habits and clothes and foods, your style of talk. All to make an already unstable woman a screaming lunatic. Have her declared mentally incompetent so you could take control of her money and her estate. How big is the estate, Connor? Big, I'd judge it to be. No end of money. It has to be a fabulous grab to rate your fancy technique in crime. I say again, you can't prove a thing. Because you're really Ralph Connor, huh? And can prove it. Birth certificate, relative stuck somewhere, fingerprints. That's what you're gambling on, why you're so cocksure. You're immune, you figure. Win or lose, you can't lose. Since you're really not an impersonator, but the genuine article. Get your hat anyhow, Connor. My hat? Where are we going? To the district attorney's office to see what charge he can fit to your kind of cute scheme. Offhand, I'd say conspiracy. But what do you bet the D.A. finds a few more in the book? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Three times mean good times on NBC. NBC.